At this time, please welcome back to the stage, Dan Weil. There we go. Thank you again. Yes, thank, thank you. you Okay, this has been an amazing night so far. Everybody take a deep breath. I don't know about you, I'm, I, I feel like this is a little bit of a marathon, but it's a great one. So, we have a, an exciting next event. I am so thrilled to be given the honor to introduce the Chopra brothers, Sanjeev and Deepak Chopra, and to be included in a discussion focusing on various liver topics and insight to what led to their prestigious medical careers. Dr. Sanjeev Chopra is professor of medicine and served as faculty dean for continuing medical education at Harvard Medical School for 12 years. He serves as a Marshall Wolf master clinician educator Brigham and, at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Chopra has more than 150 publications and nine books to his credit. Dr. Chopra is editor-in-chief of the hepatology section of Up to Date, the most widely used electronic textbook in the world subscribed to by more than 1.2 million physicians in 195 countries. He's an author and sought after inspirational speaker across the United States and abroad, addressing diverse audiences on topics related to medicine, leadership, happiness, and living with purpose. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sanjeev Chopra. Well, now that I've introduced the younger brother, and I love introducing the younger brother before the older brother, because I am a younger brother, and typically known as Bobby Wiles' little brother in Chicago, but I digress. Deepak Chopra is a world-renowned pioneer in integrative medicine and personal transformation. He is the founder of the Chopra Foundation, a nonprofit entity for research on well-being and humanitarianism, and Chopra Global, a modern-day health company at the intersection of science and spirituality. Time Magazine, has described Dr. Chopra as one of the top 100 heroes and icons of the century. He is the author of over 90 books himself, including numerous New York Times bestsellers. His latest book, Total Meditation, Practices in Living the Awakened Life, explores and reinterprets the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual benefits that the practice of medicine could bring. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming Dr. Deepak Chopra. Okay, I've got my notes. I don't want to miss anything. Okay, Sanjeev. So, you and your brother have certainly had very interesting career paths. Was there an influential person in your life or a specific moment that inspired you to go into medicine? Yeah, the most influential person in my life uh, was our late father, Dr. K. L. Chopra, a brilliant physician, humanitarian, cardiologist. And I was 12 years of age, studying at St. Columbus High School in New Delhi, arguably the preeminent high school for boys in India. Deepak was in the same school, three years ahead of me. We were staying with our uncle and aunt because our parents wanted to finish our schooling in New Delhi. Our father would get posted in different towns every three years. So on a very warm, sultry afternoon, weekend, I play a cricket match. And Sunday evening around 6.37, I'm reading something, I'm not feeling well. I take a nap and I wake up and I'm terrified. I open my eyes and I can't see. Everything is dark. I blink my eyes, I open them again, everything is dark. I nudge Deepak, I said, Deepak, I can't see. And he must have done visual threat and reckoned I wasn't faking it and he started to cry. I have one brother and he's turned blind. 
My uncle takes us, takes me to the military hospital in New Delhi. And the doctors examine me, including, I believe, an ophthalmologist, and they don't have the foggiest ideas to what's going on. I can hear them talking, hysterical blindness? I'm this very happy kid, a pretty decent athlete, a good student. <laughs> and finally, they connect with my father, 300 miles away in an army jeep. This is 1961, long distance phone call. And my dad says very calmly, tell me everything that's happened to Sanjeev in the last two months. They said, oh, he had a laceration to his right leg with a sharp object, taken to the casualty ward, and he got stitches. He said, did he get an antibiotic? And they looked and mentioned it. He asked one more question, actually two more questions. He said, did he get a tetanus shot? And very proudly they said, yes, he got a tetanus shot. And he said, what kind of tetanus shot? Anti-tetanus serum, ATS, or anti-tetanus toxoid? They looked in the records and they said, ATS. And I have no idea how my father divined this, but he said, Sanjeev is having a ray idiosyncratic reaction to the anti-tetanus serum. It occurs perhaps one in half a million. He has severe bilateral optic neuritis, a localized form of serious serum sickness. His optic nerves are ready to burst. Start an intravenous and give him massive doses of corticosteroids. And that was done, and about 12 hours later, my vision returned. I've told this story to professors of ophthalmology at Mass Eye and Air, UCLA, Johns Hopkins. I said, what, your father knew that? You know, if he hadn't done it, you could have been visually impaired or even blind for life. So the next morning when I woke up, I said my dharma, which is a Sanskrit word that incorporates vocation, authenticity, moral truth, is to be a doctor like my father. So if I recall correctly, were you, forgive me if I'm wrong on this, you were 11 and, 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 and roughly just turning nine at that time? Or? I was eight turning nine, Deepak and was three years older. Still is three years you, you, old. Right, I, I, the other way. You were turning nine and Deepak, yeah. you were 11. Yeah. Unbelievable. So Deepak, obviously you and your brothers have, you and your brother have had similar journeys as scholars, um, but you've adopted different philosophies. Sanjeev has embraced more Western medicine with you embracing more Eastern philosophies. What led to your journey? Uh, being more, being an endocrinologist and a spiritualist, what, what was it that triggered you going down that path? First of all, I have to reinforce what Sanjeev said. My father was an amazing clinician and diagnostician. Political. He could um, tell the PR interval on an EKG by listening to the difference between the fourth sound <coughs> and the first sound. And he was extraordinary. My mother was a storyteller. And so I didn't want to go into medicine. I wanted to write stories, fiction. And at the age of 14, my father gave me books, all fiction, Somerset Mom, many others. They were all about physicians. So I decided to become a doctor, which wasn't my intention. And I did train in endocrinology, but then I devoted the rest of my life to studying uh, what I call the healing response what uh, is homeostasis and in medical school the first two lessons are homeostasis and inflammation i spent my life helping people decrease inflammation and maximize homeostasis that's basically it simple enough yeah. okay so um sanjeev I, I i know because i as i explained to you i'm already listening to your book brothers. Uh, I know you guys had some mischief growing up, like all good brothers should. Uh, can you share your funny story about uh, Deepak and the BB? Uh, so, you know, uh, you may want to listen to this one, folks. Even when I was seven years of age, I was a pretty good shot with the BB gun, the catapult, and bow and arrow. And we're living in Jabalpur, Central India. And I take my BB gun and there's a pole about five feet tall. And on it, I put a can of cherry blossom black boot polish. And I'm shooting my BB gun. And after a while, Deepa comes and stands behind with his head just above the cherry blossom shoe polish can. I said, Deepak, what are you doing? He said, you don't miss ever. Go ahead and shoot. 
William Tell, the apple. So I shoot, I actually miss, and it hits him here in the chin. And he's bleeding, and he says, now we're gonna go and tell mom and grandma that I tripped and a piece of barbed wire nicked me in the chin. I said, Deepak, that's a lie. He says, we've been reading about the god Ram and his younger brother Lakshman. I am Ram, the god. You are my younger brother Lakshman. You have to listen to me. So we go home. My mother cleans the wound, applies uh, an antiseptic, puts a Band-Aid. So what happened? I said, you know, I tripped. There was a piece of barbed wire. I think it nicked my chin. So my father comes home, our father comes home that night at dinner and asks the same story, and I give the same lie, Deepak is nodding. The next day, for Deepak, there's this swelling. And my grandmother turns to my father and says, you're supposed to be the most brilliant doctor in India. You make all these diagnoses. You've missed the diagnosis in your own son. There's probably a foreign body, maybe a piece of barbed wire out there, take him for an x-ray. So off he goes to the hospital with my dad for an x-ray and I'm pacing the veranda and every few minutes I go and, mom, did dad call, did dad call? She says, you're very worried about your brother. And the phone rings and guess what the x-ray showed? That pellet was still lodged in there. So I'm responsible for his Kirk Douglas <laughs> chin. <laughs> So I've, I've got a couple more questions, one for each of you, and this will turn a little bit more to the topic of liver. So coffee, which I do love. You've written and spoken about the positive effects of coffee. When we hear coffee is good for the liver, can you explain exactly what that means? Yeah, so the first study appeared about 20 years ago, and it said coffee drinkers have lower levels of liver enzymes. So if we have elevated liver enzymes, it's usually indicative of liver damage, acute or chronic. That's interesting, but the next study came out and said coffee drinkers have less hepatic fibrosis, less scarring. If there are scarring around fibrous tissue around islands of liver cells, totally circumscribed by scar tissue, that's what's called cirrhosis. So coffee drinkers have less hepatic fibrosis, the next study came out that patients with chronic liver disease who drink two cups of regular coffee a day, 50% reduction in hospitalization and mortality from chronic liver disease. Chronic liver disease afflicts maybe one and a half billion people in the world. And then primary liver cancer, we heard about that, is now the third leading cause of cancer mortality in the world. And in 11 countries, including Egypt and Mongolia, it is the number one cause of cancer mortality. And if you drink two cups of regular coffee a day, 40% reduction in liver cancer mortality. None of these studies have been sponsored by Starbucks. They're mechanistic explanations. At the end of my shoelace, there's a piece of plastic. At the end of our chromosomes, we have something called telomeres. Elizabeth Blackburn, brilliant scientist, together with two other colleagues, got the Nobel Prize in Medicine Physiology in 2009 for a work on telomeres and telomerase. So now I want you to listen carefully. Increased caffeine intake is linked with shortened telomeres. Shortened telomeres means accelerated cellular aging. Who has shortened telomeres? Mothers of chronically severely disabled children. Caregivers of people with Alzheimer's. Who has longer telomeres? People who exercise, people who, who meditate, people on the Mediterranean diet, and people who drink coffee. So increased caffeine intake is linked with shortened telomeres. Increased coffee intake is linked with longer telomeres. It's not the caffeine. Coffee has a thousand constituents. It lowers the risk of Seven common cancers, Parkinsonism, Alzheimer's, diabetes, cirrhosis, alcoholic cirrhosis. A recent study, patients with advanced and metastatic colon cancer who drink coffee, including decaf, 
have improved disease-free survival. JAMA Oncology, and it's dose-dependent. Two cups better than one, three better than two. So it's truly the magical elixir. It's a superfood. 2.25 billion people in the world consume coffee. So doctor's orders. Wait staff, if you haven't already served everybody coffee, please do so. <laughs> okay, so Deepak, mindfulness. Uh, as a personal practice, uh, is mindfulness as a personal pra practice only helping people to think more clearly about their health, or is the practice bringing about better health? And here's why I'm asking. The American Liver Foundation recently highlighted an exercise offered to a group of people with primary biliary cholangitis, PBC, who experienced severe levels of fatigue. They were led on an eight-week mindfulness training program and encouraged to continue the practice beyond the guided sessions on their own. Five to six months later, more than half of the participants said that their fatigue levels fell below what is even considered moderate. Can you talk about this? So yeah, I'm familiar with that study, but uh, Sanjeev mentioned uh, Elizabeth Blackburn, yeah. and we just finished uh, publishing a study with her in Nature. Mindfulness, one week, increased telomerase by 40%. There's no drug that does that, to my knowledge. And when we presented this data, we also presented other data which showed that all the genes that cause self-regulation homeostasis went up some 17-fold, and all the genes that cause or are associated with Alzheimer's, heart disease, many kinds of autoimmune diseases went down. When Eric Schott presented this data at a conference, somebody asked him, do you practice mindfulness? He said, no. They asked him, are you planning to? He said, no. So he just published this study. He says, yes, I'm going to figure out how, make, how to make drugs out of this. And he left Mount Sinai and is now running a drug company to look at what uh, these metabolic pathways are all about. But I would say he's probably wasting his time. He should drink some coffee. <laughs> uh, on mindfulness and fatigue and pain, yes, anything that quietens the mind will also cause self-regulation, homeostasis. It's not just fatigue, it's pain and many other illnesses because the healing response includes everything, mind, body, and spirit. I just had a very quick uh, sentence. Deepak and I and our wives and our kids have been meditating for many, many years. We started meditating about 40 years ago. And I have a saying, you should meditate once a day. And if you don't have time to do that, you should meditate twice a day. Absolutely. Thank you both so much for spending the evening with us. Thank you so much. It, it really has been a truly memorable experience. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a round of applause for the Chopra brothers. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming